there is one place for Elden Ring's Shadow of the Erd Tree to begin, and how fitting that you would have to defeat a boss this unforgettable. The boss that gatekeeps Elden Ring's DLC, and one that has so many reasons that you would want to defeat him. This video is the story of Moog, and your story against Moog, a build up to the Lord of Blood and how he came befitting of that name. There are very specific reasons why Moog is the chosen boss for the DLC's entrance, and by the end of this video, you may have some newfound enjoyment at seeing Moog's fall to your blade. This is the journey of the Elden Ring community into the Mogwin Palace. Dearest Mikola, you must abide alone a while. Welcome, honored guest, to the birthplace of our dynasty. Nicola is mine and mine alone. Shooting for the stars this year and trying to hit 100,000 subscribers. If you're here, give the little button a love tap. It might take you to stories about other Souls-like moments and other games I enjoy. Thanks for that. I think you've earned this. This video will go over everything surrounding Moog Lord of Blood, from the Elden Ring community, the quest surrounding, to the known lore, the characters, the player's story of first seeing this boss, and the fight itself. So please use chapters as a way to watch however you want to. The Lord of Blood was not always in the power position he was in when you found him. Moog was a part of the wackiest family tree that only the brains of George R.R. R. Martin's love of family drama and Miyazaki's masochism and uh, foot endeavors could place him in. Moog is a demigod and a shard bearer, meaning he's got some godlike powers and royalty. But you may wonder how Moog looks like this and is the child of these two. He also has a brother that looks like this. So how did Moog and his twin brother Morgoth become Omenborn? Was it the Dung Eater who defiled their corpses before they returned to the tree? Even though they were born this way and not reborn by the tree. So there really wasn't a chance for the Dung Eater to do that. Some answers may be coming in Elden Ring's DLC, so take this with a grain of salt. But omens in Elden Ring are considered impure due to the cursed blood. And for this reason, most of them get hunted down by omen killers. For Moog and Morgoth, they were not hunted and killed, but shunned and shackled to the sewers of Leyendel, where they were forced to spend their lives. While Morgoth stored his omen cursed blood within his sword under his staff and decided to remove his horns, Moog let them fully grow. So much so that one is even coming out of his eye. When the Elden Ring was shattered, Morgoth decided to defend the Golden Order at all costs, even though the Order showed him nothing but pain and scrutiny. Moog opted to lean into his omen blood. Moog's pain from his own horn stabbing his eye gave him a connection to an outer god named the Formless Mother, who we don't know a lot about. But think of these outer gods like Lovecraftian Great Ones, giving power to Chosen Ones who worship them. The Formless Mother ignited his blood with flame and gave him the new power of blood flame magic. When Merica broke the Elden Ring, Moog saw a chance to escape his prison and got a piece of the Elden Ring. What he was up to during the shattering of the Elden Ring was starting his own cult called the Bloody Fingers and trying to bring the Formless Mother to full power. While you should seek even more answers in the DLC, Moog is not a sympathetic villain. He became infatuated with his younger stepbrother named Mikola, who the DLC will mostly be about. Mikola was cursed with eternal youth, and while Mikola has a big plot around the Erd Tree and the start of his own era, it got cut short when he was growing in the new Halig Tree. You can even see where he might have been stolen while cocooning near Melania's boss fight. Basically, Moog kidnapped Mikola while he was a cocoon, evolving. Then he brought Mikola to his palace underground, where he began feeding Mikola his blood and the blood of his followers in hope of starting an era of blood. Moog, by all means, is a word I can't really say on YouTube, but he was arranging a marriage for a vegetative Mikola who is a child. Yeah, you can put two and two together. We're getting Chris Hansen on the phone, buddy. 
The reason why Mikola is important is because he is an Empyrean and has the ability to become a new god, the perfect vessel for the Formless Mother. So you decided to fight Moog because, well, he's one of Elden Ring's strongest bosses, and this is how it went. Let me guess, the hand's gonna move. I knew it, man. Oh, man, I've played a lot of these games. Oh, yo! That's so sick. Here he is. There's Mog. I know he's a dude. I mean, like, you know, when you you get you like my lady. To the birthplace of our dynasty. Oh shit! That guy looks badass. Moog's cutscene might have been the biggest tell that the DLC was coming of all. We never see Mikola in the entire main game, and only can piece together an idea of Mikola from statues, paintings, and the Saint Trina's quest line. But in this cutscene we see his hand extended and blood dripping out to bring out Moog. During the fight, we see the blood flame that the Formless Mother would have blessed him with too. And additionally, we might be seeing this blood flame with Mesmer in the DLC. The fight starts off relatively difficult, but nothing you couldn't handle until... What? What? Is my... What? He's spamming again, and I, what is the fuck is this? Um, what is going on? Is mine and mine alone. So how do I beat that? Knee heal. Knee heal is Latin for nothing. Maybe no blood left in the player? So Moog sprouts wings and flies down into the player, comboing in ways that are pretty unpredictable compared to most bosses. Moog's boss design is not only incredible and worthy of its spotlight, but his moveset makes him at times unapproachable when he's showering the player down with blood, ripping his claws to create omen fire, and overall just putting the exact beat down on you the way he was trained to do. There's only two things you should know about this fight, and why people have called it an easier one compared to others. Again, exploration is your friend. If you explored Leyendel's sewers enough to find Moog in the sewers, you would know that his shackle was close by. Just like Morgoth, Moog's shackle was bounded to him to the shunning grounds. So by finding this and using it in the boss fight, you can stun him in place to get some free hits in. Additionally, by exploring the worlds of the land between, coming across the purifying crystal tier in the Altus Plateau, you can negate the damage from the knee heal. There is something to be said about the first playthrough and not knowing about either of these items. Were you who's watching at home, like me, and didn't know that you could make the fight easier? Leave me a comment. One piece of information a lot of people wondered with the DLC announcement is... Well, why do you have to defeat Moog and Radon? Moog made sense, but Radon, what's up with that? I believe it's because if you look at the map, the Mogwin Palace is right under Kaelid, so it makes sense that we would get more answers to come in the DLC. Whether you did the Vare quest, or if you went all the way to the Halig Tree Medallion route and took this tiny portal to see Moog, this place was cut off from the rest of the underground. The Formless Mother and Moog recruited quite the army, and it's no wonder when people bring up the Elden Ring's demigods as the seven deadly sins, they typically put Moog to represent greed. So greedy that every single rune farm was located here. Elden Ring took players far away from Moog when they first set foot in the lands between. And one thing you might want to know if you have or haven't played Elden Ring before is that you won't see this boss 
until the end game. Or at least if you take traditional pathing and don't do a quest to get to him. See, that's the beauty of this boss fight. Exploration is your best friend. And it started right when the Elden Ring community opened the doors to Limgrave. See this guy with a bloody mask? He is one option to get to Moog. This NPC is named Vare, and he worked for the Horn Man himself. In fact, Vare is a part of a group of worshippers for Moog called the Bloody Fingers. That's the beauty of Elden Ring. I meant it when I said to explore, and sometimes exploring means killing Vare, because he says this. You are maidenless. For others, it could mean talking to him and doing a full quest to reach Moog early. Vade's quest is one of the main ones in the game, and is fairly easy to complete compared to others. As a warning to anyone who needs it, you should never do an Elden Ring quest without revisiting an NPC after defeating a main game boss. So any boss with a cool cutscene, best talk to those NPCs and exhaust all of their dialogue. For Vade, this meant defeating Godric, then coming back. Ah, there you are. You claimed a great room and had your audience. Oh, I have a gift for you. Something fit only for the wise. A means for circumventing the draw of the two fingers. Give it a try, won't you? These are invasion materials to invade other players online. And there's an offline version of this too. Again, you could completely miss this whole quest in your run if you just didn't explore all of the dialogue options or find Vare. I'm glad that you're enjoying my gift. Mm. I knew it from the very start. You have a taste for noble blood, a knight to serve Luminary Moog, the Lord of Blood, and establish a new dynasty. What do you say? my lambkin now take this for your final trial soak the cloth with a maiden's blood this is where vike's quest from my video on the frenzied flame comes into play as you'll be needing to use his maiden's corpse to soak the cloth with blood ah my lambkin You've completed your final trial, and with this, you are a formal inductee. Now, give me your finger. This noble blood will be an immutable badge of honor once it settles inside of you. Oh, good heavens. Clench your teeth or something. <laughs> Never forget that feeling of agony, for it is what binds you to Luminary Moog, to all of us. <laughs> yes, your finger is now in your possession, other than the time it was connected to you. And this allows you to invade indefinitely. So, your finger is pretty strong after all. <coughs> oh, another thing. You should have this. A medal granted by the new Moguin dynasty. With the power to grant audience with Luminary Moog, I've gone out of my way to provide one to you. But you mustn't use it just yet. The meeting must wait until the Moguin dynasty commences. Luminary Moog yet slumbers beside the divinity. We must endure a little longer. Now, of course, by doing this, you're able to make a meeting with Moog happen very early in the game. But Vare is right because Moog is one of the hardest bosses in the game without the right levels and build to beat him down. If you wanted to, you could even invade Vade later on to complete the quest. You seek violence, heedless of my warning, though you have been raised to a knight of the dynasty. I am pained to the very depths of my being. Why? 
must I be? Christ! no born. Oh, luminary Moog. Please grant the strength you promised. I have given everything. Please, my lord. So this Mo guy must be pretty special if Vare is willing to go through all of that for him. There's still some questions that remain for Moog's story. Who is the Formless Mother? Do Morgoth and Moog actively hate each other? Did they bond in the Shunning Grounds? Is Mikula truly dead? Will we get answers about the Omens? About how both Moog and Morgoth became Omenborn? Why does Moog's weapon look oddly similar to Mesmer the Impaler's weapon? The DLC is going to answer a lot of questions, when there is a ton of omen architecture and bosses. I can't wait. Moog's fight is a brilliant one, combining elements of flight, blood flame attacks, knee heals, and all sorts of preparation that can only be summed up by one word, exploration. Thank you for watching my video, I really appreciate it, and please come along for the journey.